Welcome back to Madame Quest New Horizons. I'm Dear Darling. As you can see, what's going on on our lovely island of Fawn Hollow today, where we will be vibing out the usual. You might be like, How's the farmland art coming along? Um, it's taken me way longer than I expected to do uh, one part of a refined sketch. Not even that complex a part. Like, um, I, I will say, I've I finished the refined sketch for D, um, and I might be busy. Actually, now I look at it, this head shape is really weird. Why have I done it like that? Okay, well, that needs to that needs to change. And I've done the refined sketch of some npcs which might be interesting but i've not um done the villagers i would say the hardest part is very much trying to figure out what outfit no well i'll get into that in a second hello everyone right now in four hello 6 8 p.m on thursday march 21st 2024 um the hardest part is very much figuring out what outfit people are wearing because you know this one i'll talk about i suppose when i do the commentary uh for thumbnail art but i've taken a bit of a detour from doing like in in-game outfits and um si not situations but uh things so directly related to in-game mechanics because after doing it for four years i was just like it's getting pretty difficult to come up with a new thing every single time like it's fun to put together outfits but i'm just like now we're starting to run out of like outfits which i feel like are cohesive and make sense together and also fit the vibe of the character so now i'm just like okay well i know I think I talked about it a bit in the previous one. I was like, I want to do like more scenario sort of things and it'll be context based what uh, people are wearing. But that does leave um, the challenge, the challenge which by the way, I fully love and love to do. It's like one of my favorite parts, I think of drawing things is um, fashion and clothes and trying to figure out what people are wearing. It's trying to figure out a cohesive outfit which makes sense for this scenario. So I've done it for D, and I, f I feel like it reasonably fits. Um, I'm not quite sure what I'm gonna do with, with some of the other ones, to be perfectly honest. Like some, some of them I've thought about, and I'm just like, yeah, I think that makes sense for this, this person, or uh, well, this villager, this villager, and this villager. Like, like Rowan is one which makes sense to me. Vivian makes sense to me. Raymond, I can kind of see what's going on, and then like I, I sort of have an idea for Amelia and Polo, but the rest of them is sort of just like I'm, I really no idea what Phoebe's gonna be wearing. To be perfectly honest, we're gonna just like find out, I suppose, as we do it. And stuff like that but um it should be a fun one um that, that's how i describe this one is it's a fun one <laughs> um compared to some of the previous ones not with the others ones on when on or when fun it's just like this one it feels like certainly much the most light-hearted um of all of them that i've done so far um so yeah i don't know I, I don't even know if i'm gonna finish it this weekend because as i well actually i'm now busy on sunday not saturday um and I'm going to be busy on Friday because of a D&D session. And I'm going to be busy a little bit tonight while I'm prepping for a D&D session. Um, I'm not really sure how much to prep actually for this one. <laughs> it's it's a very interesting dichotomy. And as I've spoken about between the two groups, one of them being so chaotic and one of them being like, well, okay, they, they both have their own sort of like different sense of chaos, I suppose. But one of the group is more like on the max grow they're much more methodical about sort of things and i can follow through the, the logic of exactly what's going to happen you know i set up these sort of like plot scenario these sort of things i put like baits in the water and hooks of that and then they, they they don't immediately bite onto it they sort of like invest they sniff around it be like hmm is this something that we want to pursue is this not they really like to get the full scope of what's going on and then you know from there they can do more chaotic things on i suppose the micro scale so it's more like on the macro scale it's like easy to see how it's going to well, it's not easy to see necessarily, but it's much more um, thought through, I suppose. They, they take the time to actually think through exactly what we're going to do. Then on the micro scale, things can be a bit more chaotic. Well, the other group seems to be <laughs> almost on the inverse, I suppose. Not quite the inverse, because it's still quite chaotic on the micro scale. But the macro scale is just insanely like chaotic, to be perfectly honest. I even said, like, <laughs> um, for, one, for one group, I have, like, only a set amount of scenes open. I have, like, eight scenes open because, you know, I'm just like, this is probably what we're going to do. And then, you know, lo and behold, when presented with all the information and investigating that sort of thing, we go, okay, let's do what seems like a reasonable thing. And then the other group, I'm just like, I have no idea what you're going to do, like, at literally any moment. So I've got, so I have, like, so many different tabs open or different scenes that I could just switch to just in case I need it. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so I, I need to prep for that. Um, I'm not exactly sure what's going to happen. Like, um, I know what's going to happen like in the first half of the session, I suppose, but I don't really know what's going to happen in the second half. That's going to be a bit more of a, a mystery. The only thing I definitely need to do is I need to add the subclasses to Foundry. But yeah, I mean, that'll be today. I, I will say, like, it's been a while since I've actually done some drawing, to be perfectly honest. I think this is, might be... The most recent, like, what? when's the last time I did, like, a big drawing? I think it must have been back in October. I was doing, well, I started doing some art challenges um, with a friend, but the thing is, and then I just got too busy, I couldn't finish it. Um, I did the first two prompts for, I, it, was, it was not Inktober, it was, like, 
it was another one of those October drawing ones, except for it was one where each prompt was like five days long or something. And I came up with a, a concept for each of them. I just never got around to finishing them. Like I finished the first two completely. And then the third one I've finished colouring, but I don't think I got to rendering it. And I actually thought it was a kind of cool concept. I had like an interesting concept for the first four. And then the last two were sort of just like a, uh, I don't don't really have a as interesting concept anymore, but you know, as at least we can sort of, sort of roll with it. <laughs> um, but it was cool because um, when I was drawing it, I was like, okay, you know what I'm going to have a focus on? I'm going to have a focus on doing very interesting perspectives, I suppose, of challenging perspectives. So the first one is like, um, my cat, one of my cats is sort of like lying down and it's like over her shoulder, sort of, not quite over her shoulder, but like near her head looking down. It, I don't know how you describe a pose. And the other one's from like above and the third one is from like below. And it, it's all this confusing stuff. Anyway, sorry, that's not what we're here to talk about. What are we here to talk about? I don't really know. What should we chat about today? Mm, should, should we check in? Hold on, Team 0%, how are you doing? I, I keep checking in because I, I want to see when we actually do it, to be honest. When is that moment? Not yet. I guess, it, I guess it's still going on, which is fair enough. Trimming herbs, very difficult. Trimming, trimming with herbs. And that sort of thing. Um, I don't know, what should we talk about? R slash games. What, what's going on in the game sphere? Boulder's Gate 3. There's, there's a lot of stuff about Boulder's Gate 3. How can Founder breaks down RPG budgets and Larian's impact on the genre? We can't invest $200 million to make Boulder's Gate 3. That's that's fair. Um, I mean, I don't think you need to make Boulder's Gate 3, to be perfectly honest, but <laughs> even just competition in that genre, I suppose, the things are, which are along the lines are pretty cool. I don't like... I mean... I'm not going to say that I don't understand where the founder is coming from. Like, obviously, Baldur's Gate 3 was sort of like a flash and pan sort of miracle when it comes to gaming in the first place. It's a fantastic game if you haven't played it and generally worth the investment, I suppose, if you want to play it. You could get probably like hundreds of hours out of playtime and still see different things every single time you play through it. Um, but it's like, you know, just like how we have modern takes, I suppose, and like AAA versions of games. And then we have like indie devs coming up to give their versions on the games as well, which are, you know, necessarily smaller in scope. Um, but I think by via interesting spins on these sort of genres in the first place, you can still evolve gaming, I suppose, as a landscape rather than just need, needing to recreate something and over and over and over again. Now, I'm not saying that they're trying to recreate things over and over and over again, but I suppose it's like, by questioning as what makes, what I suppose at the core of the heart of a game makes it good or engaging, I suppose, to people, you can get some interesting spin-offs of like different genres and things like that, right? Um, Yeah, I don't know what's... We're talking about voice acting. Voice acting definitely not, like, a, a need. And I mean, certainly, in, I, I would expect it from, like, a AAA game. But for an indie game, I think most people go in with a presumption that no voice acting is kind of expensive. It's not feasible to do, have, like, every single character voice acted. Maybe, like, voice acting in a sense that will have, like, lines, like, generic lines to read out. You know, a la Paradise Killer is actually a pretty good example where they've got all the dialogue, um, I suppose, in text, but they have, like, general things that they say. They have, like, a happy thing, a scared thing, an angry thing, a sad thing, a questioning thing, like, phrase which they say for each of them to match, I suppose, with dialogue we're saying. <laughs> Bottle Gate 3, if unsuccessful, could have killed that studio outright. That, that's fair. <laughs> Sorry, a little bit of a pause. Um, self root, chop wood, hot items, okay. Um, yeah, I, 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 there was this, like, a comment about how the fact that Larian Studios took, like, a huge risk on Baldur's Gate 3 and that, like, if it was unsuccessful, it would have very much put the entire studio under. Uh, the rest of the comment was, um, maybe I still have it open. I still do have it open. Is that, um... Our cat's founder doesn't want to put the studio in that situation, which I think is totally, totally fair, to be honest. You know, sometimes things which push the envelope about taking risks and sometimes things are not, you know. Um, people like to, I suppose, abide by a certain ruling that you've got to take risks to make waves, I suppose, in the industry or in any industry, which, you know, certainly, you know, taking risks can give the chance to make big waves in the industry, but equally can give... Um, What's the opposite of a wave? Like an anti-wave, I suppose. Something which has no effect whatsoever on it. Small incremental 
progresses is just as important, I suppose, the risky big ones that you strive for. And I suppose throughout life, you kind of need a, a mix of both, you know, to have progress in general, you know. <laughs> it's, as it, it's as most things are, you know, variety is the slice of life after all. So I certainly can't blame that. Also, which studio is Owlcat? I've been saying this the entire time and I haven't even really thought about who Owlcat are. <laughs> if I've even played any of their games. Rogue Trader, what? I don't know, Pathfinder? Oh, the other people have made Pathfinder? I should have no idea. <laughs> Makes sense. Um, There's a lot of like risky things which end up... Well, I mean, I suppose inherently with like any creative work itself. Well, maybe not any creative work, I suppose, but... <laughs> Especially with indie work or with like um if you're not like a, one of a, the big massive triple A studios or whatever. Um, for any creative industry, like um creating something creative, even slightly different from a norm, I suppose is always a risk. Even creating something of a norm is kind of like a risk as well if you can't do it up to the um the polish if you don't have it up to snuff, I suppose, of what people want to find for this particular thing, you know? You might be like, What on earth are you talking about? Uh what what I mean is basically like create creative Cre creations inherently are like a risky endeavor aren't they in the first place it's not it's not like someone being like oh i'm gonna take some time to oh, try and like write a book or something it's not inherently risky i suppose compared to much more i suppose stable um industries in the first place and that, maybe that's more of like a well, I don't know. I'm, I'm like, I don't really have my pulse on like the nation of all these different industries. To be perfectly honest, I only sort of have passing knowledge, so it's not really my place. I suppose comment on it from like an um, insider perspective. The only thing I can really say is from the outside. Um, but you know, like writing a book, you know, trying to get it published, inherently a risky thing in the first place. It's why I like a lot of these creative uh, jobs that if you want to pursue them, people often say that you'll kind of have to do them like as a side hobby for first and then you, you need like an actual stable job in the first place to sustain yourself because, you know, I suppose the truth of the matter is it's quite difficult um, to get like a living or a living wage for most of these sort of things. I'm not so you can't and not say that people don't. It's just, you know, it's a risk. It's, it's an inherent risk in, in van. I suppose it depends on who you are as a person, how much risk you're willing to take. Because, of course, by working, like, for taking this example, I suppose, by pursuing a creative um, job or role or something like that, while also working a different job can, you know, lead to burnout and things like that. It's inherently a risk. But, like, if you weren't working the other job, you could maybe invest more time into the creative pursuit and that sort of thing. And maybe you had more chance, I suppose, of actually it paying off. I don't know. It kind of depends on how risky, how much of a risk taker you are in the first place. How much, how much of a risk taker am I? Not really that big a risk taker, I would say. Um, maybe at times people, I'm not sure. Maybe, maybe people will. I don't know. Would people ever see me as a risk taker? Not really. I feel like maybe I might take risks here and there, but they're actually not as big as risks as you might think. They may like give the appearance of risks. About something like I'm biting off more than I than I can chew or something like that. But a lot of the time, it's because it's actually something I've like thought through, I've evaluated the consequences, I've prepped for it, I plan for exactly how I'm going to tackle it. So despite it being seeming like a larger undertaking or something like that, it's not actually that big a risk in the first place because I already like minimised it from like my end. But of course, everything I do sort of internally is not reflective externally necessarily. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, so. I guess along the short of what I'm trying to say is like, I, I, of course I love it when um, video game studios or and studios in general creative pursuits uh, take big risks because it's cool. It's cool to see things pay off. It's cool to see something which you go like, wow, this is going to revolutionise things in general. Um, but obviously I suppose the people who really do that in the first place or people who can do that safely in the first place tend to be like these large studios which have this immense sort of like financial buffer or whatever, right? And oftentimes you only really get to do that, I suppose, by having safe things built up in the first place. I mean, I mean, like Disney is probably like a really good example. Like Disney are sort of probably like rolling in money, I suppose. They probably have so much financial from fi finances from just like merchandise from creative works, I suppose, et cetera, et cetera, that they bring in every single year. Um, but they could afford, you know, you'd think be able to, you think they'd be able to afford to take like a risk on like a big, movie here we like once in a while which goes in a creative direction etc etc although of course there's that ongoing criticism that disney are sort of getting more 
complacent with their movies as they, they go on in recent years, you know. And I mean, the, the biggest thing that people always talk about is how Wish is like the most generic Disney movie ever made, despite it being like a hundred year anniversary celebration. People would have thought it'd be really sort of like reaching out for the stars or something like that, but it ends up being like fine, is what people. <laughs> it's a general fine to bad is a general consensus i get from it which is a, a shame you know obviously it's easy for me as an individual in my position like not and um, with my life experiences just be like oh you know if i had like disney level if i was like well, well i mean not Walt disney but i don't know who a disney ceo is right now um but like if i was a, a, a ceo of like a massive studio and that sort of thing i'd be like yeah of course i would like take risks in there like um i i, I feel like from from a more realistic perspective i'd be like okay we'll do some things which are safe bets and then we'll take some those safe bets can fuel the big risks and you know we try something completely different try something a bit more niche try something a bit more weird and see what we can get done um yeah i don't really know where i was going for this but it, it's a I, I suppose the eternal battle between um the creative industries and the business side of things at the same time you know you've got to Making art for the sake of art, while a very noble cause in the first place, is not um, necessarily reflective, I suppose, of a realistic situation for a lot of people, you know. You can't really feed yourself off um, people going, oh, that's pretty niche, or something like that, right? Um, so, you know, you understand the need for something much more predictable, much more basic, if it has much wider appeal, which, um, of course, sort of ticks the business boxes, right? Um, I don't know. It's, it's an eternal struggle. And I don't really know why I'm talking about it because I'm not really that <laughs> well informed about this entire thing. It's just sort of, again, I'm, I'm talking from the outside looking in. It's just interesting to think about. Interesting to think about because maybe, you know, perhaps a, a bit of a rare case. A rare, rare case, I suppose. Because I, I, I see myself as somewhat creative. I wouldn't say I'm like a, a full creative and that sort of thing. I often say that I, I sort of tend to straddle the line between like scientific inquiry and creative expression you know, sort of dip my toes in both, not saying that they had to be mutually exclusive, as I often say that they, they aren't. Um, but like, I, I guess I can kind of see from a business perspective as well, from a creative expression perspective, and it can kind of depends on the situation, right? <laughs> um, I don't really know where I was going with this, to be perfectly honest. I, I guess along the short way, it's like, you know, Baldur's Gate 3, super cool game. Would love it when studio takes risks like that sort of thing, but it's not like, it's not like every studio has to take a risk. That's kind of why there's multiple it's kind of why there's competition it's not like one sort of monopoly studio who makes all games that ever exist it's why that some of them you know will take a risk and you know some will succeed like larian and some will probably go under because of like it they put so much time and effort into something and it just doesn't pan out and it's unfortunate you know to say the very least it would be wonderful if everything could just stay around forever but i suppose by the way of how civilization works you know with capitalism and all that it's not just it's not it's, it's just not <laughs> how it works which is a shame, you know, wouldn't it be nice to live forever, you know, in, in famous words of the Beach Boys, um, but wouldn't it be nice to be able to live in a world, I suppose, where creative expression need not be bounded by a warrior of, like, fiduciary, <laughs> I was going to say rep repayments, which is, like, such a weird word to use for that, uh, fiduciary, like, goals in the first place. Wouldn't it be nice? What would I do if I had, like, unlimited creative funding and potential with no risk of any well i suppose negative consequence of what my risk will be i don't know to be perfectly honest that's a good question i've never really thought about i never really thought about that i mean if you asked me maybe like a decade ago i probably would have said more things like this sort of like augmented reality animation sort of thing you know like how people got these vr chats these vtubers sort of models etc etc i think it'll be like that that seems like a fun thing to sort of pursue further allow people to not just you know like watch animation but they can like be the animation they start they can tell tell the stories well on their own terms right uh, allowing the tools and that sort of thing where everyone can be an artist and everyone can be a creative that, that sounds like something which I'd, certainly appeals to me but of course with the advent of things like well back in general now i suppose the, the gap has sort of been narrowing isn't it <laughs> um i don't really know that's a really good question maybe i'll have to think about that i'm not sure what i do if i had like in, infinite money to spend on things I guess I would probably just pursue a lot of small things which I found sort of mildly interesting, right? I don't really know. Anyway, I'm going to round this episode up here. I don't even know what I've spoken about this episode, but if you haven't watching, thank you very much. It's been Adam across New Horizons. I've been Dear Darling. Likes, comments, subscription, shares, greatly appreciated. Socials, Discord down below. Hope we see each other again, but for now, it's our farewell. So until next time, bye-bye for now.